Coming up on Arirang News, North Korea sends a letter to the UN protesting the seizure of one of its ships by the US for allegedly smuggling coal. The North's ambassador to the UN is due to hold a press conference on the issue. South Korea's exports in information and communications technology were down again in April because of continued weakness in semiconductors. Oversupply continues to be a problem. And the U.S. government backs off its ban on Chinese tech giant Huawei, giving American companies 90 days to do the updates they need to do to prevent major disruptions. It's 4 o'clock p.m. here in Seoul. Thank you for joining us on Arirang News. I'm Devin Whiting. North Korea has appealed to the United Nations for help in the case of a North Korean cargo ship seized by the U.S. for violating American sanctions on the regime. It circulated a letter, and the North Korean ambassador to the U.N. is planning a press conference. Lee ji has more. North Korea has reportedly sent a letter to the United Nations criticizing the U.S. for holding one of its bulk carrier ships captive and is arguing the issue should be dealt with by the international body. Radio Free Asia reports that the Office of the Spokesperson for the U.N. Secretary General said on Monday that it received a letter from North Korea's permanent representative to the U.N. last week and that it is reviewing it. The letter, as disclosed by the North State media, argues the U.S. seizure of a North Korean vessel under U.S. law is an unlawful, outrageous act, and such unilateral U.S. sanctions go against the U.N. Charter and international law. To this, the Office of the Spokesperson for the U.N. Secretary General reportedly said that as requested, the letter has been circulated as an official document to the General Assembly and the Security Council. It added that questions relating to possible sanctions evasions and member states' implementation of relevant U.N. Security Council resolutions concerning North Korea are matters for the member states to address. This comes as the U.S. seized a vessel known as the Wise Honest earlier this month as it filed a civil forfeiture complaint against the ship for allegedly violating U.S. and U.N. sanctions by illegally shipping coal from the north. The ship was previously detained by Indonesia in April 2018 and was since moved by the U.S. to American Samoa. It's the first time the U.S. has seized a North Korean cargo vessel for violating sanctions, and North Korea criticized the U.S. for its gangster-like move. According to the U.N., Kim Sung, the North Korean ambassador to the U.N., is to hold a press conference at the New York headquarters Tuesday morning local time regarding the matter. During the rare press conference, Kim is expected to reiterate the North's message that the move goes against the spirit of Sentosa Agreement and the UN should take relevant steps. Lee Ji-won, Arirang News. A new report suggests that thousands of North Korean women and underage girls are being forced into sexual slavery in China. According to a London-based rights group, the, the Korea Future Initiative, North Korean women and girls usually aged between 12 and 29, but sometimes even as young as nine years old, are prostituted for just over four U.S. dollars or sold as wives for about $145 and forced into online sex services. The escapees are trapped because otherwise the Chinese government sends them back home where they face torture and possibly death. The illicit trade generates profits of over 100 million U.S. dollars a year. Many are sold more than once and are forced into at least one form of sexual slavery within a year after escaping the North. South Korean President Moon Jae-in met over lunch Tuesday with the top commanders of the South Korean and U.S. militaries at the Blue House. There, he said the two sides' ironclad alliance has shown that it works in the light of recent developments. Here's the president. Uh, Han 어, 그런 메시지를 내므로서 어, 북한이 새롭게 더 추가적인 도발을 하지 않는 한 어, 대화의 모멘텀을 유지해 나갈 수 
The president added that the two countries' alliance should be one that lasts even after peace is established on the Korean Peninsula, as it's essential for the peace and stability of the entire Northeast Asian region. Guests at the lunch included Defense Minister Chung kyung doo the Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff Park han gi and General Robert Abrams of U.S. Forces Korea. It was Moon's first time as president meeting with such a select few commanders from both sides. President Moon has thanked the Crown Prince of the UAE, Mohammed bin Zayed Al Nahyan, for his active support in securing the release of a South Korean man who was abducted in Libya last year by militants. According to the Blue House spokesperson, during their 20-minute phone conversation late Tuesday, the president said it was a good example of how strong the two countries' relations are. They agreed that their bilateral ties have developed immensely since their summit in February and said their cooperation in 5G, artificial intelligence and energy is making solid progress. Also, sharing concerns over attacks on civilian vessel vessels near the Strait of Hormuz, South Korea and the UAE agreed to work together for stability in the Middle East. In football, South Korean forward Son Hung Min has been named one of the key players for Tottenham Hotspur this season. British online newspaper The Independent has given Son 8 out of 10 for his performance this season, its highest rating in the Tottenham squad, which he shares with French midfielder Moussa Sissoko and Belgian defender Jan Vertonghen. Son scored 12 goals and got 6 assists in the Premier League. He also scored four times in the Champions League to help Spurs reach the final for the first time in their history. More disappointing news for South Korea's already struggling exports. Shipments from the ICT sector last month continued to fall. Our Ko Ryun Hee explains why. South Korea's exports of ICT products fell again in April, which could be another alarming sign for the nation's export-reliant economy. According to the Trade Ministry on Tuesday, Korea's ICT exports slumped by 10.6 percent on year last month marking around 15.2 billion U.S. dollars. The figure has been dropping on year for six consecutive months now, and the ministry has said poor semiconductor exports are behind the fall. Chip exports decreased by more than 13 percent during the same period because of falling prices in the memory chip sector. Spot prices of 4 gigabit DRAM fell to 2.25 U.S. dollars, which is a huge drop from December's figure of 3.03 dollars. Analysts say that the market has been suffering from oversupply and lower-than-expected demand from data centers. This has hit Korean exports hard, as semiconductors account for more than 55 percent of total ICT exports. Outbound shipments of displays, another key export item, decreased by more than 16 percent. This was mainly due to the rising competition from China in the LCD panel industry. On a brighter note, exports of smartphones and computers increased. In terms of export destinations, shipments to China slumped by more than 15 percent, while exports to the U.S. jumped slightly. The ministry says many Chinese consumers are purchasing locally manufactured products. Meanwhile, the amount of imports increased slightly to around $9.5 billion, bringing the trade surplus to around $5.7 billion. To boost falling exports, the South Korean government has been venturing into new semiconductor areas, such as a non-memory field. The World Trade Organization has warned that weakness in global trade will likely continue into the second quarter because of the tensions between the U.S. and China. The WTO says its World Trade Outlook indicator has reached a nine-year low of 96.3. A reading greater than 100 suggests above-trend growth in trade, and below 100 means below-trend growth. The WTO said the outlook could get worse if the tensions are not resolved or if macroeconomic policy fails to adjust to the changing circumstances. It's time now for an in-depth look at markets around the world, including here in Korea. And for that, I'm joined on the line by Mr. Daniel Yu, Global Strategist at Kium Securities. Mr. Yu, thanks for coming on today. Thank you for having me. So overnight on Wall Street, U.S. tech stocks especially fell uh, big time. 
The Nasdaq down almost one and a half percent and the Dow about a third of a percent. Obviously, the blacklisting of Huawei playing a role there. Uh, what's happening there? Yes. So with the news of U.S.-China trade dispute continue to worsen, uh, global market continues to fall uh, in the past couple of days. Uh, so far, the global market has uh, fallen about 5% from its peak in early May. Uh, the news of the restriction on Huawei products on trade resulted in a big sellout of most of the global equity market, including U.S. and China, and the, particularly within the IT sectors. As you mentioned, U.S. Nasdaq was down close to 1.5%. Uh, however, though, um, over the night, the U.S. government on Monday temporarily eased the, some trade restriction imposed uh, on Huawei's, uh, China's Huawei, a move to start to minimize the disruption of the telecom companies' customers around the world. Uh, the U.S. Commerce Department allowed Huawei Technologies to purchase American-made goods in order to maintain the existing network and provide software updates to existing Huawei handsets. Uh, Google did not immediately respond to this, but nevertheless, it seems that still there is a standpoint in regards to the trade dispute at this point in time. Uh, we're not sure whether this is going to be a long-term process, uh, but for the time being, there is a, some uh, uh, possibility that uh, the, the dispute might be settled uh, in the short period of time. Uh, with this kind of news, the markets are recovering nicely. The Korean market has recovered. Uh, cost be 0.27% up, cost that was up 0.27% as well. Uh, Chinese market also recovered quite nicely, 1.2% for Shanghai and 1.9% for Shenzhen index. Yeah, we'll see if things go the same way tomorrow on Wall Street. Uh, but because of the trade tensions here in Korea, the local currency has weakened to right about 1,201 almost against the dollar. We could end up seeing some intervention by the Korean financial authorities. How is it looking today, and when do you think this, this might turn around? Uh, yes, the Korean won seems to be stabilizing with the news that the, uh, the government might intervene in regards to the rate. Uh, given that uh, recently the Korean interest rate uh, seems to be lower than U.S., and the Bank of Korea is expected to lower interest rate probably by about 25 basis points in the late third quarter or beginning of the fourth quarter, uh, because of that concern, the investor seems to be betting on Korean won depreciation. Um, as you have said, the Korean won has depreciated uh, quite significantly from around 11.30, 11.40 level to now almost as high as 1,200. Uh, the peak was 1195.5. Uh, today, it's stabilizing a bit to uh, 1193 level. Uh, however, though, if you look at uh, uh, in a longer term basis, uh, if you look at Korea's trade surplus, it is uh, 4.12 billion in April. Uh, and there is a relative low amount of a government bond, uh, which is only 36.6% of GDP at the end of 2018. Uh, we don't think that the one depreciation will continue in the longer term, and it will, should stabilize in the longer, uh, longer term. Uh, and also, as you said, government will be intervening in regards to the one. Uh, yes, having a weak one will have a very positive impact on the export, uh, but uh, as for the consumptions and domestic uh, consumers, uh, the, the burden will be quite high. So we need to see more stable Korean yuan. And given the fact that the trade surplus and the high level, uh, le small level of debt, uh, we think that the yuan should appreciate to 1140 level in the longer term. Got it. Well, let's uh, talk about oil for a minute. OPEC members and non-members like Russia met last weekend and agreed to uh, keep production down again this year. Oil prices have, of course, risen recently. Uh, where do you see this going? Yes. Um, as you said, oil price rose for the second day in a row as the signs of OPEC and its allies will extend production cuts beyond June of this year. Uh, however, though, there's a still continuation of worry about deterioration of U.S.-China trade relationship, uh, and the global economy might be slowing down because of this. Uh, so the continuation of the both side of the uh, supply as well as demand uh, are in, in, in a concern. If you look at the extension of the supply cuts by the OPEC, uh, we think that it could be quite sizable. Uh, and also, uh, with the concern about U.S. and Iran war uh, happening or, uh, maybe in the future, uh, possibility of the oil price rising is definitely here. Uh, 
so people might be thinking that oil prices might rise to as high as uh, previous peak of $78 level. Uh, but we don't think that's going to be happening because of the uh, U.S. shale gas uh, productions continue to be very strong. And also Russia might be putting some efforts to put some additional productions uh, into the table. So all being said, we think that the oil price should be fairly stable, somewhere between 60 to 65 level. But in the short term, maybe because of the concern of the productions, uh, might hit to as high as $70 in the short term. All right, Mr. Yu. Well, we'll have to leave it there for today. Thanks for coming on. We appreciate your insights. Thank you very much. Now, as we just talked about, the Trump administration has backed off somewhat from its decision to blacklist the Chinese telecom company Huawei. They've decided to let American companies keep doing business with Huawei for the next three months. Our Kim Dami tells us more. On Monday, the U.S. government eased some of the restrictions it imposed last week on China's Huawei, suggesting changes to Huawei's supply chain may have immediate, far-reaching consequences. The U.S. Commerce Department will allow the Chinese company to buy American-made products for 90 days in order to maintain existing networks and provide software updates to existing Huawei handsets. Huawei, however, is still banned from purchasing American parts and components for manufacturing new products without license approvals. The delay suggests that the U.S. intends to limit the impact on firms that rely on Huawei and to prevent possible network blackouts. Meanwhile, Chinese customers are turning their back on iPhones and showing their disdain for Apple products on social media. One of those customers was a senior media figure Hu Shijin, the editor of China's Global Times newspaper, who tweeted on Monday that he had switched to a Huawei phone, ditching the iPhone that he had been using for nine years. Considering his status, there is a rising concern China may be in the course of promoting Apple boycotts as retaliation against the Trump administration's blacklisting of Huawei. This all comes after the U.S. added Huawei and 68 other affiliates to an expert blacklist last Thursday, prohibiting them from purchasing goods made in the U.S. Top IT companies, including Google, have cut ties with Huawei as well. The Chinese tech firm is yet to comment on the U.S. delay announced on Monday, but has pledged to keep contributing to the development and growth of Android around the world. China's Foreign Affairs Ministry also said it is committed to supporting Chinese enterprises by defending their legitimate rights through legal means. Kim Dami, Arirang News. Chinese President Xi Jinping recently visited a facility in the city of Ganzhou where rare earth minerals are mined. That's fueled speculation that these materials might be used to retaliate against the U.S. China's Xinhua News Agency reported on Monday that President Xi was accompanied by Liu Ha, the vice premier who's been leading the Chinese side in the trade negotiations with Washington. Ganzhou is known for its rare earth mining and processing industry. The U.S. relies on China, the dominant global supplier, for about 80 percent of its rare earths imports. So the U.S. has eased its restrictions on doing business with Huawei, but American companies have reportedly been cutting off their supplies to the company. Che Shi Young spoke with some experts about how all this might affect Korea. Top IT companies in the U.S. are joining Google in cutting ties with Huawei amid the Trump administration's crackdown on Chinese tech companies. Bloomberg reported on Sunday that major semiconductor firms such as Intel and Qualcomm have told their employees that they will not supply Huawei till further notice. Analysts predict that this will hurt Huawei, the world's number two smartphone vendor, because it is heavily dependent on U.S. chips. And Reuters reported earlier the same day that Google has suspended all business with Huawei that requires the transfer of hardware and software products except those covered by open source licenses. This is a fresh blow to the Chinese company because it relies on Google for many services, including the Android operating system, the Google Play App Store, and popular applications like YouTube. This all comes after the Trump administration added Huawei and its affiliates to a trade blacklist last week, enacting restrictions that will make it difficult for the Chinese company to buy parts and components from U.S. firms. So how will this affect companies here in Korea? 
On the semiconductor front, some say it might have a positive effect for small and mid-sized chip makers since they will have a chance to reach out to China. Experts in the field explain that there will be effects both good and bad. For handphones, it might actually be good news uh, because Huawei will be limited in using U.S. technology. Uh, that means uh, uh, there's going to be a lot of technology that Huawei cannot use that Samsung or uh, LG can use. So uh, there were some worries that uh, Huawei may overtake Samsung, but it looks like uh, it may uh, Samsung may keep its position. Many finished products such as smartphones and electronics are exported to the U.S. from China. If Korean companies provide the parts that go inside them, their exports will be negatively affected. As to what local companies can do amid the escalating tensions, experts recommend that firms reach out to new export destinations other than the U.S. and China. Choi Xiong, Arirang News. Korea's leading food delivery service, Pedal Minjok, or Pemin for short, will open up next month in Vietnam, having acquired a local online food ordering platform in February. According to the company Ua Brothers, which runs Pedal Minjok, they're starting a pilot run in Vietnam. Services will first be offered in Ho Chi Minh City, soon to be followed by Hanoi and other places. The app is available on the App Store and Google Play Store. According to industry sources, Bemin will face tough competition from both local and foreign firms in Vietnam's delivery market, which is expected to top 38 million U.S. dollars by next year. Ford Motor Company has announced it's cutting about 10 percent of its global salaried workforce. Around 7,000 jobs will be gone by the end of August as part of a larger restructuring process. Ford's CEO Jim Hackett said Monday that the cuts will include both voluntary buyouts and layoffs, with open positions to be frozen as well. The company's spokesperson says there'll be about 2,300 layoffs in the U.S. With the cuts, Ford Motor will also eliminate close to a fifth of its upper-level managers, a move intended to reduce bureaucracy and speed up decision-making. The restructuring move is expected to save the American car maker $600 million U.S. dollars a year. Coffee shops are everywhere here in Korea, and now the country's coffee brewing is starting to gain global recognition. Last month, for the first time, a Korean barista was named the best in the world, and our Won Jung Hwan looks into the secret of her success. The young lady with a passionate smile is Jeon Juyeon, the winner of the 2019 World Barista Championship. She came first out of 2,500 contenders from over 50 countries in Boston last month, becoming not only the first South Korean to win the prestigious award, but also the second woman to win the title. Her dedication to coffee making began around 10 years ago, but even then, she dreamed of being the best in the world. At that time, people saw baristas as part-timers rather than a professional job. But when I saw the previous WBC videos, I realized that such career could also be respected by many people. Ever since then, I dreamed of standing on the world stage. At the previous edition of the World Barista Championship in Amsterdam, John finished in 14th place. But when she entered this year, she tried a slightly different approach trying to show coffee's magnetism by delivering her presentation with genuine passion, sitting on the table addressing the judges like they went out for a casual, friendly coffee together. The presentation contained a lot of scientific terms which were unfamiliar to many people. So in order to get closer to everyone, I came up with the idea of creating a much more friendly atmosphere when presenting my coffee. For her winning routine, Chun chose to focus on how carbohydrates affect the flavor balance experienced when drinking coffee. And to smoothly explain all of these scientific terms to judges in English, she traveled to the UK for three months. No one can be perfect in English in two or three months. But since I'm representing my country on the world stage, I wanted to at least get rid of the fear of speaking English to others. For Chun, Coffee is energy, not just from because it's full of caffeine, but also because she heard numerous times from her customers how refreshed 
and recharged they felt after drinking her coffee. Becoming the Pyrista world champion wasn't luck or magic. It was Chun's positive energy towards the judges and crowds which she has been practicing in Korea's southern city of Busan since 2009. Won Jong-hwan, Arirang News, Busan. And that brings us to the end of this newscast. Thanks for being with us. More live news coming your way at 7 p.m. Korea time.